proceedings. Please note this meeting is recorded and streamed live and these recordings are published on the relevant meeting page of the Council's website. By choosing to attend this public meeting, you are deemed to, ha to have given your consent to being filmed and recorded and for any footage to be broadcast or published. If the alarm sounds, the premise must be ev evacuated immediately. Do not spend time collating, collecting personal belongings. All es emergency es escape routes are clearly signed. And once you have left the building, the assembly point is in the high street opposite the Guildhall. Members and other speakers are reminded to use their microphones when, um, when speaking. So, um, apologies. Uh, we have uh, uh, substitutes. We have Councillor Lamb for Councillor Gregson, and we've also got apologies from Councillor Cronin. Thank you, Chair. Right, and uh, decorations of interest? No. And I think we've got no public participation. That's correct, Chair. So, um, first of all, um, the minutes. Um, we've got two lots of minutes. So the first is um, 25th of um, July, and I'll take them per page. So page one, page two, and page three. Are we, um, are we okay with those? And then the meeting on the 3rd of October, Again, page one, or so page five, page six, page seven, and page eight. Again, are we okay with those? Okay. So, um, first of all, review of um, the high street. Um, and I just want to just say that I don't know if any of you went, but uh, I certainly went on Thursday night to the um, culmination of the Worcestershire life stories. Um, and it was, it was actually, I think, really amazing um, that we had um, a number of venues like Royal Worcester, Tudor House, um, Call Market, St. Swithin's University, amongst other things. And in all the venues, they had films that, um, that showed sort of um, the life in Worcester in the 1950s and um, the stories that people had, had told. And really, it was a culmination of a probably about three or four year um, project. And I'd like to thank everybody that's in, that was involved. Um, the only um, thing I think we, the, um, some, some residents thought that perhaps we ought to have uh, repeated it on other nights because, but uh, the, uh, it was really well, achi well um, achieved and uh, it was well done. So, um, review, of high, re review of the high street. Thank you. Um, yeah, the review of the high street, we've looked at where we've come from, the COVID issues, um, and also uh, the impact of the cost of living and energy crisis. So we're looking at where we've, where we've been and what we've done and where we're going to next. So we've had quite a positive response from um, COVID. Our footfall has increased uh, quite well, and we are back up and running. We've had a number of initiatives like the Welcome Back Fund that have helped this along and helped the high street become more vibrant again. Um, we've also launched our, our new Discover app, which is our Worcester app, um, which started slowly, but is really gaining momentum now. And there are an awful lot of businesses on there and lots of events and activities that highlight just how um, lively and creative Worcester is and encourages people to attend and um, come to the city. Um, museums obviously are doing very, very well. They've had some incredible exhibitions um, in the past and had some great um, viewers um, and viewer numbers, uh, including the current Canaletto exhibition, which is quite outstanding. 
The Tourism Information Centre is doing a grand business um, and is seeing large numbers of people um, and very much um, using it as a, a centre, uh, a stepping off point to go to other places in the city. Um, their trade is very, very good and the, if you pop in at all, it's always very, very busy. We have achieved purple flag status. Um, this was led by the, uh, the bid, um, but supported by the council. Um, and it is a really positive um, that the evening and night time um, is such a safe and secure place to come and such a positive place to be at night. Um, so that's very uh, incredibly well done to get the purple flag status. We are struggling a bit with car parking, but it balances out in that um, we are getting more people um, traveling in different ways into the city. So there is more cycling, there is more walking, there are more people using public transport. So it, it swings and roundabouts. Yes, car parking is struggling, but it is coming back. But then we also have people uh, actively traveling into the city rather than just using uh, private cars. We do have a little bit of an issue with uh, vacancies, uh, empty retail vacancies. Um, we are continuing to turn them over and are focusing on them very much and trying to speak with the owners to, uh, to get a positive outcome from them. Uh, our the empty retail grants programme that we delivered has had some very positive responses. All 11 people that took uh, a property through that um, initiative are still in those properties and they're still in those units and are still intending to trade from them. One who is even looking at purchasing the premises. So that had a very positive impact. Moving forward, there are a number of things um, that we are looking at. Future High Streets Fund is a large scheme and has a number of elements to it. The public realm, you'll have noticed, is changing across the city uh, and improving the way the, the city looks and feels. We also have the property enhancement scheme is continuing. Um, so we are supporting uh, property owners to improve their buildings in the city uh, through a grants programme. We have UK SBF that's coming on board now. Um, there are lots of activities there, some property enhancement grants coming through that, um, some um, support for businesses uh, to, again, could be retail now. Because we don't have the restrictions of EU funding previously, we couldn't work with retail organisations. We can with UK SBF moving forward. And we have Towns Fund. So we are looking at the redevelopment of Shrub Hill, um, which should have a, an impact because it's uh, just on the outskirts of the city. And it is where people come into the city. So being able to improve that and bring that back into a, a positive economic use uh, will have a great impact on the, the city centre. Um, we are doing well compared to other areas. We are having, um, we are gaining momentum with uh, the opportunities and the people that are coming into Worcester. Um, and it will continue uh, with the changes to the, that we're using with the Towns Fund for the Riverside, the heritage projects, the active travel activity that we're doing. Um, we are on the up, we are moving upwards. There will always be challenges and we will have to um, look at, the, at some initiatives around the cost of living and the energy crisis, but we are on the right track and I think we are having a positive response. Are there any questions? I just want to just say um, I forgot to declare an interest. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a board member of the bid. So um, and I'd just like to just say that um, th I think the bid is, is really important at the moment. Um, we've achieved purple flag they've um done a lot of work around um particularly um fry street new street and uh, done all the lighting and everything in there and it's a real flagship and uh, it's a real benefit to, to the actual city center and um i think uh, that they've achieved a lot so um simon and then um james at the moment. And Thanks, Chair. I wonder, Zoe, whether I can ask you a bit more about what seems on the face of it, as you said, a very successful scheme, which is for a very small amount of money, with all the money that we spend helping um, get people back into retail, if I can put it like that, and helping those, those shops that are vacant. Um, now, I don't know how 91 uh, vacancies in the city centre and seven in St John's compare with 
equivalent cities that we would compare ourselves with, or even large towns, you know, whether that's good, whether that's broadly uh, in line with other, other places, similar size and scale and population, or whether, whether that's poor. But it's still a lot of premises, and I wonder what more we could do um, in terms of replicating the success of that. So that's the first question. The second one is about the changing nature, if I put it, of the high street. So you can all see visually as we walk around, there are different businesses that are choosing to locate and trade in the city centre than maybe 10 or 15, 20 years ago. So what are, what are the kind of trends telling us in the kinds of businesses that need or want to be located in the city? And what are we doing to facilitate that, attract them, uh, it, so that we can, we can actually provide what consumers want ultimately to, to utilise? Okay, taking your first question, having looked at the numbers, we aren't um, we are better than uh, an awful lot of places. So places like um, our local neighbours in the Black Country, Wolverhampton, Warsaw, we are doing much better than them. The, our, our retail, uh, our vacancies are much smaller than theirs. Um, so they, it's not too bad. Obviously, they, nobody wants to see vacancies in the high street, um, but we are we're not as bad. You know, it's not great because we don't want to see vacancies, but we're not as bad as some other areas. So we are, uh, and we do seem to be filling them much quicker. Uh, it's keeping people in them at the moment with the ed energy crisis is our biggest issue. Um, if it becomes too expensive for people, they can't afford to continue uh, trading, then that is our biggest issue, is keeping people. One of the reasons we bounce back so well is because an awful lot of our traders are independents. They're small traders, so they didn't, um, they didn't suffer the major cuts uh, like everybody seen Mark, Marks and Spencers and Dorothy Perkins and all those. Uh, that covered a lot of people's high streets and they got nothing else. We did have a lot of independent traders in there, which is why we bounced back so well. Our, our task is to keep those independent traders. So it's providing the business support uh, and the help and guidance as much as possible to help them through the, uh, the difficult uh, circumstances that we've got. It's identifying the most appropriate premises for them. Um, it's working hand in hand with them to try and get um, to support them throughout it. Um, identifying grants and opportunities to keep them trading um, is where we move to next. The independent um, mixture on the high street is the, the positive thing. Trying to find um, a mixture of uses for the high street so it's not just retail sales um, that there are uh, residential there are um, a mixture of opportunities on the high street is what we need to be looking for in the future uh chair thanks very much um could i just focus in on the museums aspect of this because there are some quite dramatic figures contained within that paragraph uh, the the National Museum's 73% down during that particular time frame. Uh, we are doing very well and long may that continue. I guess where I want to sort of probe, if I may, is is what is, is, is there a trend emerging here about how people living in Worcester or in the immediate locality actually see, you know, what they want in a more sort of confined area or, you know, is there something is it too early to, to really begin to, to see the evidence emerging, I guess, as to you know, what people want from the sort of culture offer? I think initially people um, post-COVID were too nervous, were quite nervous about moving into other bigger cities. Actually, because they'd got such a, a facility on their own doorstep, people really responded and were eager to... They were eager to take part in cultural activities, but actually were too nervous to go to some of the much bigger ones. So this provided the perfect opportunity. Since they've come in, um, Philippa and the team have done a great job in keeping them coming. So they've responded to the sort of activity that people enjoyed and the comments that people have come back with. And they're managing to keep them coming back with new things and other activities. So we're, we're at an early stage at the moment because obviously the, the larger national places are seeing footfall coming back now that people have become more confident. But actually we are still retaining the people coming in. So hopefully we're going in the right direction with it. Um, if I may, I mean, are there any sort of tentative data, is there any tentative data emerging that tell us what 2022 is saying on, on this? Because I think there's, there's something we have to grasp here, isn't there? Um, you know, building the cultural offer into Worcester, the plan and how it goes forward 
over the, the, the coming years, you know, it, it's going to become a significant part, and we're talking about the economy, a significant part of a, a more significant part of our balance sheet. How we retain that is going to be the, you know, and, and I'm, I know from your answer that you're clearly, everyone's on board with that, but it, 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 it's how we sort of secure that, isn't it? That, Thank you. If I could just add to what um, has already been said, really, um, one of the issues with the museums is the fact that generally the um, the visitors have tended to be towards the older older age profile, and those people have been more nervous about returning to attractions. So that's one of the reasons why um, museums, in particular, have lagged behind other types of attraction in terms of recovery. So that's the first point. I think the other point to add is that um, with the current Canaletto exhibition, we're, because people are now booking to come to see it, we are collecting some really, really valuable data uh, to give us not just a mailing list for future activities, but also to give us a much better position in terms of understanding the reach and the coverage of visitors. And I had a quick look at the figures um, the other day and it is, it is gratifying to see that people are traveling from quite a distance, um, way outside of the West Midlands in some cases, to come to the exhibition. So it does, it does go to show, I think, that if you get the offer right, people will actually travel a, a greater distance. And of course, you know, without wishing to teach anybody to suck eggs, um, the multiplier effect of getting somebody to come to, to Worcester for the day, they then go on to spend money elsewhere in the shops and bars and restaurants. So I think it, it's looking very positive at the moment, but um, you know, we have to keep our, our, our foot to the floor with all of these things to keep the momentum going. Um, if I may, while I've got the floor, just picking up on a couple of the other points that Simon raised in terms of getting the empty properties back into use, it is encouraging that we've now got uh, 15 properties being um, uh, repaired, for want of a better phrase, through the Future High Streets Fund around the Angel Place area. Um, I was quite nervous about the take up of that originally because we've tried it elsewhere and not been very successful. Um, but we've had 15 uh, individual um, property owners come forward. So if that all goes through, that will make a difference. And in terms of the change of use, I think one of the things that we mustn't forget is the change to planning uh, regime. Um, we are we are moving away from the days of having you know large areas of the city centre, where we will only allow retailers as a a you know a a one property uh, uh, areas um, to attract other uses as well. So I think that's an important change as well. Thank you. And also, I think uh, the um, redevelopment of um, Reindeer Court as well in much more individual shops as well has been a real um, plus to the town. Karen. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to say, you know, the, um, the event the other night for the life stories, the wonderful thing about it is the city did feel extremely safe. I had people say to me they felt very comfortable in the environment. So that kind of event drawing families and all sorts of range of people um, so I want to thank you know the team for everybody involved in that um, with the um, I want to a couple of points if that's okay with the improvements to the public realm obviously some of in, in some of it you know the new paving we've got some new trees it's all starting to look a lot better but the next stage I looked on the county council website and there's, there's no details for that yet it's it's coming forward to me that's the most crucial bit of this piece of work it's where we see a lot of problems um, with traffic and conflict between pedestrians and cyclists I'm wondering when we're going to see some details or design for that area and whether we can feedback at all to it or how, how it works we're moving into the uh, the design for the next phase of that for stage four of that now did you want to say something David only only to add to that the the next the next phase is around uh, Trinity and St Nicholas Street are going to be released shortly um, and then we'll be moving on to um, 
uh, Fourgate Street. Um, and for me, that, and you know, I've had conversations with both Mark and Simon, we've, we've talked long and hard about this. That, that last phase where we get the demolition, fingers crossed, of Jack's, and we get the opening up of the viaduct, and we get the improved movement across the road, where the, the crossing will move and the bus stop will move to make it a lot easier when people come out of Fourgate Street to cross over the road and go down towards the river, down the viaduct, and making that a much more welcoming um, sense of arrival is, is going to be really, really important as well. While you go out, because obviously Arboretum, <laughs> we've got the tithing and Barbourne Road, lots and lots of really good independent shops. Do you count those in your occupancy rates as well? Yeah, they're all counted in the occupancy rates. Fantastic, that's great to hear. Um, and then just the, the, the final thing, I suppose it's that the, with the car parking levels down, it, it, it is a concern, you know, we, a reduced income, you know, I think is reflected across the country actually, you see car parking levels down everywhere. Um, and it's a positive thing for active travel, but obviously we need to maintain an income to um, mitigate, you know, other risks that we've got. Um, and I, I suppose it kind of, with the problems we've had in the car parking, I suppose it, it, it makes it time to actually look at um, anonymies and, you know, how it, how it all works together, perhaps, as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think David's said most of it, Lucy. I was just going to say, um, just on the, just to shape or limit the bound, the, um, the, the, the future high streets fund is very much... You know, the, the area it, it, it can be spent on is, is like a red line on a map anyway. So it's not like it's flexible beyond that. We had to agree with government when we got, when we got the money. And the other thing is, is very much sort of for improving the public realm areas. It's not about the highway. It's not about changes in the highway. That's a different debate. The money is for, for very much sort of, and, and I don't think anybody would disagree or we won't any, Disagreement that the that the the piece from Fourgate Street up um, is, is is pretty poor and has been pretty poor, for, and so upgrading that and improving the quality of that has always been the sort of the, the most important part. You know, the um, uh, the station is our is the main station for in terms of numbers. It's three times I think more than we that we get at Shrub Hill. Um, it's the first vista of people's experience here in, in Worcester and you know improving that uh, is, is so important not to say the other issues aren't but I just thought it's important that we sort of we're clear I guess what that we bid for that money we can't really now go and say we don't want to do this we want to do this it's it, there is we there was a business case and we 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 submitted that so um, I think detail issues of that, then there may be some scope around making sure, you know, if there's if there's small issues around lines and signs and 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 about how the highway works, then those I'm sure can be considered. But the whole scale changes in you know traffic flow and and what and, and space, I think those are those are without outside the scope of the of the highway of the future high streets fund anyway. Thought that would be helpful. Yeah, thank thank you. Yeah, I mean one thing that I've noticed on the the stuff that's been done at the moment is you know where the, the cycle racks are which they look lovely there are no drop curbs so you know getting down from you know it's a beautiful um heritage curb isn't it but it's actually quite high so it's that kind of detail that's obviously important for walking and cycling for getting you if lifting your bike up a curb can be quite difficult um and ambulant disabled as well so it's that kind of detail that i think we could still address thank you thank you chair um at a previous uh, head, there was a report from the museum's uh, lady, um, and I asked her at that point about this uh, idea, a, a campaign to turn right out of the station. Is that still something that's being considered? I mean, obviously, you have to turn right to get to the museum, so it seems linked. Um, but there's a lot on the, on, if you go right, you go into the minor town, I suppose. <laughs> there's a lot there to be seen, the Georgian uh, part of the city. I just wonder if, if there was anything planned at all to exploit that a bit more. 
that, that's still very much on the cards. I don't have a, an up-to-date position here and now on where that is, but certainly when we look to do Fourgate Street, um, we want people to turn, can they turn both ways? Not at the same time. <laughs> But go, let's let them go right first, go up to the museum and then come back down the other way. So, or, or further up, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's an awful lot further up on that side of the, of the city. So that will be part of the improvements that we're looking to make when we do Forco Street. the contents of this report so thank you so we know um, is the arts and cultural strategy so Zoe it's me again sorry yeah um, this is uh, the final draft of the arts and cultural strategy uh, this has been going on for some time we've had a various um, elements of uh, consultation. We had some work with festivals and events. Uh, we've done our own consultation again this year um, and we have taken the feedback from that consultation uh, and placed it into the arts and cultural strategy that you'll, you'll see and will have received. Um, the biggest um, response we got from everybody was that we didn't want it all to be performance that we needed to take into account all of the arts, so the fine arts, the applied arts, everything. Um, one of the issues we showed on the consultation, the people that responded to the consultation pretty much were predominantly over 40. And one of the things we need to do is engage our young people in our arts and culture. Um, so that will be a focus moving forward. Um, the actual strategy itself has uh, some key um, key objectives um, which is around leadership and developing capacity um, wider participation amongst others there is an action plan attached which is the living part of the document that will be constantly up updated and moving uh, with new targets on it as we move through so that will be the living part of the document we're looking at the um, strategy to be in place for um, three years um, with that action plan up great updated constantly throughout that three year period um, are there any questions uh, thank you chair um, in in terms of attracting um, young people and, and others into our you know into cultural events but not only into that but picking up fine art skills craft skills whatever um, have and I, I suspect this might be a bit specific for this debate or this discussion, but have we considered hosting workshops for certain act types of activities? I, I recently attended something at Worcester Porter, it was a piece of fun, it was relatively affordable, good cup of tea afterwards, of, of hand painting one of their cups using one of their designs. I didn't do particularly well, but it was, it was a good evening nonetheless that type of thing introducing people into new crafts and new arts and new types of activities have we considered doing anything along those lines yeah we're working with a number of stakeholder groups looking at, at what options we've got alongside this will need to be a fundraising strategy because it all costs money yeah. um, and arts organizations don't tend to be the richest organisation. So alongside this, there will be some fundraising that we'll need to do. So we are working with our key stakeholders to look at the opportunities we've got to deliver some of that, particularly workshop activity with young people, how we can source the funding and then how we can deliver it. So it will come throughout the, the period of the action plan. Um, but yeah, we are looking at those options. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair, thank you. Um, uh, the, the breadth of, the, of the, the document in terms of the arts is, is admirable, it's great. Uh, and I'm, I acknowledge the point you make about reaching out to younger people in terms of getting their sense of, of what they want from the arts. <clears throat> I guess the, the, the question that kind of emerges from that though is, are we, is the breadth of our approach encompassing all parts of our community? Because there are significant parts of the community who would feel that there's, there's not a lot of room for them to claim ownership 
in terms of what the document is saying. Uh, and you know, Worcester is an incredibly diverse community. Uh, and whilst I, I feel there's an enormous amount that's in there that's a real merit, I just want that sense of, of confirmation, if you like, that we are we, we have the full parameter of Worcester in, in our sites, as it were. That is part of the stakeholder engagement. We, Worcester City Council won't deliver the majority of this uh, arts and cultural strategy. It will be partners. Um, it will be those arts organisations or those cultural organisations that will be delivering. We will be there to support. We will be there to provide guidance. We will be there to provide leadership and uh, help them source the funding to deliver it. So, yes, we will try and uh, encompass as many stakeholders as possible to support a, the widest possible range of activities. Um, but we are probably not the people that will lead on all of this activity. There will be other partners that will be leading. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, um, I've got a selection of somewhat disparate comments, um, some of them mine, some of them plucked from the comments that are provided by others. Uh, I'm going to end on a question. So is it OK if I deliver all of that in, in yeah. one tirade, a monologue? Uh, it's not a tirade, really. Um, so, yeah, comment number one is uh, from one of the people who've responded to the consultation. Uh, where is the how? I think um, sort of smart targets, um, you know, specific measurable can't remember what a stands for um thank you very much we'll get there in the end um i think um you know where is the how is another way of saying where are the smart targets and i think um you know if i'd given this to my wife to look at she'd say exactly the same thing or you know i think we need to be more specific with strategies i appreciate they're kind of overarching documents but people want to know specifically what are we going to do to improve art and culture in the city um, support for amateur organisations uh, by having affordable and dedicated space. I think that's a great suggestion by someone who's responded to this. I mean, we've got the, the kiln next door um, as an example of a space. And I went on a website today, and yes, there is a free room, but most of the rooms you have to pay. And that just rules it out for bands, for poets, for people who are skin. Um, so I do think having affordable slash free space uh, within the city to um, encourage art and culture is something worth looking at. Um, the race course is not art or culture for many, quote. Um, I happen to agree with that. Um, the city is polluted beyond safe levels. Um, I think Dolday is the most polluted street uh, road in the whole of the county. Um, and I think so. I'm glad that pollution, I might be wrong, but I'm glad that pollution has been raised in this consultation because it makes me think of the dual carriageway and the fact that we have a dual carriageway that splits the cathedral and the porcelain museum from the high street. Now, we are not going to sort out City Walls Road tonight, but I think this is a great opportunity to raise that issue and it's been raised by someone else. We are creating a barrier to our cultural assets by having a dual carriageway in the middle of the city. Um, now, they didn't say that, but I'm using their comment as a launch pad to make that comment. Um, almost there. Uh, comment three, page five, councillors offer little challenge. They too are a poor reflection of the people. So whoever wrote that, that's hurtful and stand for election if you want to change things. Um, and I'm actually quite glad that they wrote that hurtful comment because it's made me more bold in what I'm saying now. So I'm trying to challenge the strategy. Um, I thought our council reports, so this is the report in addition to the strategy. I thought all covering reports were meant to have at the end an assessment of environmental risk implications. So we've got financial risk implications, we've got place and so on and so on. But I thought that when we put together these reports, we are also assessing risk in terms of the environment. And talking of which, in this sustainability and um, in the action, in sorry again, in the strategy for arts and culture, there's no mention of the sustainability strategy. And in the sustainability strategy, it states that this strategy is key to the work of the city council moving forward, and must be fully embedded if our visions are to be realised. As other strategies, for example, the arts and culture strategy, 
are developed or revised, they will take note of the sustainability strategy. So it was quite disappointing to not see the sustainability strategy embedded in the art and culture strategy, given that we said that we'd, we'd do that. So I'm going to end on a question. Has this particular strategy on art and culture in Worcester, has it been inspired by and compared with other art and culture strategies created by other similar sized towns and cities? Um, I want to be positive as well. There were some, you know, some great statistics about being most visited or one of the most visited places and so on. I, I try not to be too down about it. I mean, we've been compared with places like Cheltenham, which I think is incredible. Um, have we been inspired by places like that? Um, and if not, can we develop the strategy further so that we are punching above our weight? I hope that was useful and not just a rant. Yeah. Uh, yes, we did do comparisons with other uh, cities and other towns um, to look at, at what uh, a good arts and cultural strategy should be. Um, we, uh, as far as the how in the strategy, that will be the action plan. The actual the action plan will be how we're going to do it. So it will be what we're going to do, when we're going to do it, and how we're going to measure it. You're very much right about the sustainability plan. It does need including in there, and we will include it before it goes to be published. Um, there are, we also need to include the city plan in there because that's not in there at the moment. So that will be also be included before it, it's published. But yeah, as much as possible, we, we compare to other areas such as Cheltenham, um, such as some of the black country areas. We compared to some of the London areas as well that are um, small, smaller areas, but probably um, have more money for this sort of stuff. So we did do a comparison of a number of, of arts and cultural strategies before we began to write this. Just looking at the, um, the, the feedback on the consultation, I suppose one of the things that strikes me is the relatively small number of people who actually participated. You know, there's only 27 people here. So I suppose my first question is, is how widely was this promoted? Because clearly we don't want uh, the arts and culture strategy to be driven by a, a sample of people who are not across a uh, sample of the people of Worcester. So how is it promoted? Because the numbers are very small. Um, I do think reading some of the questions, I wonder whether some the questions could have been rewritten to make them a little bit pl more plain language and clear language. Because as somebody said to this question, question four, you know, what's all this mean? And I have to say, when I read some of the questions myself, I had to think I got a bit sort of tied up and think, what are we actually being asked here? And maybe that's one of the things that puts people off get involved in consultation because if they don't understand the question, they don't feel that they can make a, a sort of educated contribution. Um, it, it was really good to see a comment that I've I've said uh, a couple of times when we've had the report from the museum service to communities about the fact that we've got this wonderful art gallery and museum, but it is too cramped, you know. And again, it'd be really great to see that movement of, you know, the museum of the, the Worcestershire soldier move to the commandery to to free up more space in the Worcester Art Gallery and Museum to show this huge art sort of collection that we've got, and some of it never sees the light of day. And sort of picking up on something that James has said, um, encouraging art and culture to be something that all ages and all different social classes and all different ethnicities get involved in. One of the things that wasn't mentioned in the report was something I really enjoyed is the Worcester Paint Festival. I mean, I, 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 I was a student in Bristol. I love street art. Wherever I go around the world, I always go and look at street art. And the Worcester Paint Festival, both this year and last year, I think was absolutely brilliant. I absolutely loved it. But it wasn't mentioned here at all, which I was quite surprised about, actually, because I think without being stereotypical you know street art is something that does tend to appeal to younger people for example and it's one of those things that I, I, I thought yeah it's great so we should make more of it in the report I think personally. Uh, on the consultation front uh, we did an awful lot of consult uh, direct consultation with stakeholders uh, to get their responses we did go out twice we went to, uh, we spoke to stakeholders uh, and sent a direct response we also went out to the general public so we have uh, promoted it through Worcester News uh, we promoted it through uh, City Life and our, our various uh, 
uh, and also directly approach some community organisations to let them know that the consultation was available for them to respond to. Um, it wasn't just uh, a paper-based consultation, although that's what you've got in front of you. We did sit down with a number of organisations to actually get their responses and to talk to them about what they wanted to see and what they thought should be included and how they wanted uh, art, the arts and cultural um, programme to move forward in the city. So we've done quite a range of consultation. Yes, maybe um, maybe the questions weren't perfect uh, and maybe we need to look at that next time. But yeah, we did as much as we possibly could uh, to promote it. We just didn't get the response, unfortunately. Um, this committee um, is uh, required to note the feedback from the consultation and approve and adopt the final version of the arts and uh, cultural strategy. And then uh, obviously um, the uh, um, working um, would the, the action plan will then come back to, to this committee to um, so that we can then review it. So, all right. Well, thank you. It's taken a bit of time, but uh, I think we've, uh, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's a good strategy. So, setting the budget. Sean, Chair Shea. Thank you, Chair. Um, evening, members. You'll be familiar with this process now that we have reached a point in the cycle when we start to think about the budget components for each of the committees. Um, this is largely by way of background. We're trying to get to a point where we start to have a dialogue with, with members and with uh, officers within each of the service departments about where we are in progress on, on a number of fronts and whether or not there's any desire for resource shifting or changing in priorities that come forward. So this is primarily designed to just to inform members and begin that, that process as we move through to the uh, January committees and then the, and the, the actual setting of the budget in February. Um, essential components of the report are the appendices. So appendix one reflects the budget's uh, votes, which are in the remit of the committee. As you can see, there's about 1.9 million pounds worth of expenditure, which is covered by this committee, and about half of which is matched by income. Um, a lot of the income in respect of uh, planning areas is fixed by national rates. So we have less control over how much income we can generate locally. It depends a lot on volumes as opposed to actually changing fees and charges, but there are, there are potential for growing income in respect of um, city centre and tourism, for example, and a couple of other areas within the remit of the committee. So one of the things that we've been asking service departments to do is to think about fees and charges, and that's something which will come back via the Income, Gener income Management Committee and through onto full council later in the year. Uh, but those are all the, the areas which this committee is covers and responsible for. In terms of the capital element, we put the whole of the capital programme rather than those which are rele relevant to each committee because often they cover several committees and, and are not easy to separate out. The only thing to bear in mind here is that we uh, inevitably, invariably, have a, a lot of capital commitments in the first year of the programme and then it tails off beyond that. The fact that it's in this current year or the next year doesn't necessarily mean the spend will incur there because we still have to go through the process of feasibility studies and evaluations before we get to the point of commitment to spend. But it goes into the cat uh, capital program as a, as a commitment to progress against that. And then finally, the fourth appendix, which I think you may have as a separate document or as a supplementary item. We uh, members will be aware from our uh, from various discussions, but in particular the all member session we had at the beginning of October that inflation uh, is having a significant impact and we are going to be dependent upon our reserves in this year to, to meet uh, unexpected costs and potentially in future years as well. A lot depends on on the level of, of support we get through our government settlement, but we are going through the process of working through city plan reserves that we have and those earmark reserves which are specific to services which aren't shown here uh, the, the the commentary in appendix four isn't designed to be a sort of statement of progress so much as a presentation of the dialogue we're currently having with service departments of where we are on, on each stage as you can see a number of the priorities that the committee have said in the past have been completed with the projects being delivered 
there are, there are a number of areas, you know, the biggest one in the middle there is fully committed and a number of the others are committed as well. They are, their expenditure was intended to be over a couple of years. So for instance, you'll note that the Worcester Life Stories project still has 50,000 pounds, even though we know that a lot of work has gone on with that. That's because it's using up the external grant first and then we'll commit the, 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 the uh, council's own funding subsequently to that. And uh, similarly, the anti-drink spiking campaign is working with the bid. So although that funding is still there, we know that that's going to be required and de deployed over time. Okay, so there's quite a lot of detail within the report. It's, as I say, it's primarily a background document. If there are questions that members have at the moment, then happy to try and answer them as far as we can with colleagues. Otherwise, it's to take forward through to uh, January. And I would, as always at this stage, make a plea that if there are areas where you think you'd like to uh, develop new ideas or explore alternatives, then the earlier notice that we have about that, then the ease really is to be able to support that as we go through to the January committee stage. Okay, happy to take any questions if members have any. Thank you. Okay, so this committee notes the budgets for the various service services identified for 2022-23, and also that the committee notes the progress made in delivering the projects, including in the included in the city plan and the city delivery plan, that are relevant to this committee and confirms the program of uh, work resourced. Okay. Thank you. So, quarter two performance. Yep. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is also a familiar report. This is our halfway stage. We've got a couple of uh, projects which are showing as red at the moment the arts and culture strategy development. That's because the milestone was set for the original draft. Uh, we simply need to update the milestones to reflect their position on that. And members have received a report this evening which uh, shows you exactly where we are. And then one little further down, uh, entitled rather confusingly, Resident Stroke Alternative Development. This was a, a, a brought into the scorecard as a means of trying to identify and capture areas within the city which need development or, or, or particular. So we, we, the aim is to try and develop a, a, a program, an ongoing program of activity, building on the, the capital work that we're currently doing, identify areas which need development and therefore bring applications for funding forward. Um, it's it, the focus at the moment is primarily on uh, the existing activities. So that one's showing red because we need to update that and keep it forward. It's more of a business as usual type Sorry. activity. Sorry. Yeah. If I may just, this was the um, this was alternative use of future high streets fund, if you recall, oh, um, where we had um, no we were no longer proceeding with the Trinity House scheme. So we were looking at one stage to bring forward alternative schemes to uh, to provide that residential development in the city. So that, that was the original um, intention of this. But as members will find in, in due course, we are we're, we're pursuing different avenues, let's put it that way, now with the Future High Streets Fund due to the uh, inflation uh, constraints that we're finding on the Scala development. So that was the original element of that. Thank you. Apologies, thanks for clarifying that. Um, uh, the notes suggest a wider remit has been considered as well. Uh, in terms of the KPIs, there are two which are largely around grants. Uh, the first is all business grants. So there's a, that's a question of just simply processing that. We haven't delivered as many as we'd quite like to at this stage, but it's only marginally behind the target. And also property enhancement grants spends are, are slightly behind where we'd like to be at this stage. but fully committed to delivering those by the end of the year. Uh, if there are any further questions, then colleagues are available and should be able to answer them. Before I open questions, um, review of South Worcestershire Development Plan. Um, I assume that all, all three councils approved the um, going out to consultation. Then why is it yellow instead of um, green? Chair, the only reason for that is that um, it's behind the original timetable for the plan review, um, but it, the three count, South Worcestershire councils did approve the 
draft plan for Regulation 19 consultation, and that will start tomorrow. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, on the museums, this is a, uh, now a suggestion, because uh, I've been hearing anecdotal reports that um, some people are, are, some residents are objecting to paying for, for the Canaletto exhibition, which I think is a, a bit mean, but um, I don't think it's very expensive. However, I was wondering whether it might be an idea, and I don't know if you do this, to, to actually make publicly available how much it costs to put on these specific exhibitions that you pay to enter for because it might make people just realise, OK, that's why I'm paying some money. Um, this actually is the first ever exhibition that we've actually charged for. Pun? No, no, no. It was the first. It was, as a joint committee, we actually, it was the first ever exhibition that we agreed to it. But David... It's a very good point, and um, and I know that that charging for um, art exhibitions is is a really difficult decision. Um, I think it, it one way to put this into context is is the fact that the the city council, rather than rather than say how much we 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 could we, we could give a we could we could attach a cost to a particular exhibition. But that wouldn't give you the true cost because obviously you've got the staff, the building, and everything else. I think it would be more um, accurate to, to to say that you know the, the city council uh, subsidises the mu museum service uh, to the tune of four hundred thousand pounds a year. Um, that's how much we pay at the moment. The county council also uh, make a uh, six-figure uh, payment as well. So it, it costs an awful lot of money, I think, is the, is the real answer uh, to this. And, and in order to bring uh, an exhibition of this calibre, um, we've had to spend even more money than we would normally spend in terms of, you know, none of the paintings could be transported together, for example, because of the value. Um, Shane's having kittens about the value because he's in charge of the insurance, so, you know. Um, <laughs> But um, se seriously, you know, the, the cost has been very significant um, and it's a difficult choice to make. I think, I think the cost to residents is four um, pounds. Mm. So on balance, I, I, you know, I, I hope that's not um, too, you know, too much of a barrier for some people. I'm sure it's not. I, I, I was just wondering if we could mitigate the... Um the outrage of having to pay from certain quarters by, you know, a, a reality check. So. Yes, we can. Um, I'm, I speak to Philippa regularly about this, obviously. Um, I, I'm not aware, I, I'm aware of one or two people not being happy, but I'm not aware of any widespread um, outrage or, or concern. So if you've got some details, I'd be happy to take them, take them away afterwards thank you thank you um i just wanted to uh, congratulate duncan and the team on the planning performance which i it seems very good um uh, it's good to see i know it's it's easy to for that to to go uh, awry and it has over the years had its moments uh, but it seems to be uh, on course at the moment um, just wondered if uh, Duncan wanted to say any more about um, performance. I have one question about uh, just that one of the indicators, the last one, which is about hectares of employment land, and it's, a, it's maybe just a, a beef of mine, but um, sorry, uh, but it's uh, that we lump B1, B2, and B8 as categories together in terms of in terms of land. In my experience, B8, which are sheds, which are large um, warehouses, uh, which are generally empty and, and employ very few people, are, are quite in demand. Um, whereas knowledge and worker intensive out employment uses, B1 and B2, offices and, uh, uh, and uh, factories, manufacturing sites, are much more difficult to get away. And I wondered whether we should have a, a more sophisticated indicator that maybe aligned more with our economic strategy than just 
hectares for any use. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, could I uh, thank Councillor Bayliss for his uh, uh, positive remarks, and I'll share those with, with the team later this week. Um, I'm pleased to say that we are heading in the right direction, um, but there is still a lot of work to do. Um, but uh, definitely the trend is going in the right direction on a lot of those, uh, those indicators. Um, as far as the employment land measure is concerned, uh, it is something that we are um, monitoring, but you're quite right. Um, that measure is a little bit too blunt at the moment, and it could do with breaking down. So um, that's something very happy to, to take away from this meeting. Thank you, Chair. Can, can I just add that um, on, the, on the table in front of members is an update um, from the question asked at the previous committee meeting. So if members have not, have not seen that, that document, there is, a, there is an update in terms of uh, the response to, I think it was Councillor Riaz that ra raised the question at the previous meeting. Thank you. Two would like to um, congratulate um, Duncan and his staff for the um, for the performances um, in the last sort of uh, two quarters. They're a lot better, and I think everyone in this it, everyone um, in this committee would like to say thank you and thank also thank your staff as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, I can see that the strategic play area development plan is due in March 2025. I was wondering whether we could see a draft report before that date. Um, certainly. Certainly. We've got a workshop next Tuesday about it. In it, and I think the it's wrong. wrong. The date's wrong. That is what I thought. Yeah, we've got the wrong. Yeah. Is it 2023? 23, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yes. <laughs> That's my... Sorry. I was wondering why it was yellow and not red, if it's 2025. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> so we've got, a, we've got a meeting next week. We've got a workshop next workshop. week for yeah. members about play strategy. And then yeah. um, we, we've got the think the report in I think it's March of next year consultation on the draft oh, yes. report. But. Mm -hmm. there was a um, there was a there was a question raised um, I think Robin raised it at the last meeting um, was it Meeting before. Anyway, there was a there was a question raised at previous committee ar around the timetable, and an answer was sent out on the twenty seventh of October uh, to members, giving them an update on the on the timetable. So, so very very briefly, um, just looking through it now, um, as as has already been said, there is a there is a, a meeting planned. Um, very shortly, um, draft uh, strategy. An all member engagement uh, session will be looked to be held in December and January and uh, report back to committee uh, subsequently. I think you should have had that. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. What, what I meant was public consultation because this is member consultation. So, would we do anything for any public at all? I'm sure there is, but we'll, I'll get that. I'll get that yeah. gap filled in for you. Thank you. Um, I mean, we've already touched on this already today, but um, talking about 56 Fourgate Street, as, as someone, this is slightly selfish, I suppose, but as someone who braves Cheddar's Cheese Alley 
on a regular basis uh, to and from to and from the railway station every morning and every evening. I'm certainly very, very keen on uh, seeing number 56 being knocked down to have this new vista down to the river, uh, free from uh, the various smells that come from the back of the pizza place next to the Odeon Cinema. When, when is this likely to start? Because obviously, the, the, I appreciate that there's, there's this phrase, slightly interesting phrase, appraising options. And I appreciate it's going to be knocked down to allow access through. There's a due date of the 31st of March. You know, time moves on. We're 1st of November tomorrow. When, when is the work likely to start? Because I appreciate, I'm not a, you know, a demolition expert, but I can imagine knocking down a property in close proximity to a railway bridge is probably, uh, yeah, it's probably quite complicated. But wh when is that likely to start? And when is it likely to com be completed? Okay. Through you, Chair. Uh, yes, the complexity is not so much in terms of the uh, the process of demolition, it's getting agreement with Network Rail to undertake that bit of the demolition which is above the line. So we could, we've got a commitment and we've, we've been in discussion with them, we've provided them with all the necessary documentation. They've advised us that it can take up to six months to get that approval. So we're basically waiting for those. We've done a, we've done a revised project plan which allows for that six month period. That's been agreed with uh, Archco. Well, our primary landlord and that will take us to April of 24. I'm currently waiting for the department to tell us that I've confirmed their latest email suggests said that they're waiting for the department to finalize agreement on the extension of the project timeline to that stage. So in order to we need that because without it we don't necessarily have the funding to progress the project. So there is a project plan but it's all dependent upon Network Rail approving the timeline. Our consultants are currently working on the uh, demolition plan, which I'm expecting by the end of this month. So we'll be all ready to go as soon as we get the nod. Yeah. The, the final, the deadline as we stand in the project program is April 24. So the expectation is that towards about this time next year, we should be in a position to, to be knocking right. it down. Right? Questions? No. So um, we note the council's quarter two performances two two thousand and twenty two to two thousand and twenty four. So uh, it concludes this meeting. Thank you.